That is a huge question for a Monday, James. You know, I could see the young people grow in confidence and especially the girls, um, you know, seeing that this is something that they can also do. Ideally, it would be a job in the tech industry at the end of it. Welcome back to Hello World, a podcast for educators interested in computing and digital making. I'm James Robinson, computing educator and advocate of the power of coding and digital making and computing as a whole to empower and change lives. And I'm Gemma Coleman, the editor of Hello World magazine and a perpetual save to desktop kind of gal. As ever, we really value your comments and feedback, which you can share at helloworld.cc forward slash podcast feedback. James, it's season four, and I can't believe you've only just invited me onto the podcast. Well, well, this is it's been it's been a long time coming, Gemma, and it's re- I'm really happy to have you to join us um, and to to share your experience and your perspective. So this week, Gemma and I have been thinking about the challenges that many people, both young and old, encounter, and asking ourselves: Can teaching coding skills help to tackle inequality? Gemma, what do you think we mean when we talk about inequality? And in your view, how can computing skills help? That is a huge question for a Monday, James. Um, I know. (laughs) What I mean to say is it's a very, um, very important question. What do we mean by inequality? Um, Well, it's a disparity, um, isn't it? A disparity of resources, a disparity of opportunity. And in computer science education terms, that's manifested in an underrepresentation of girls, ethnic minorities, choosing to study computing for a whole host of reasons. Um, so how can coding skills help tackle inequality? I think there are two quite important aspects to this. Firstly, teaching almost any useful skill to disadvantaged individuals and groups can help support them with entering the workforce, for example. Teaching coding skills is a really great example because it helps build both industry specific skills. So being able to code in Python, for example, and all those really valuable soft skills that coding brings, uh, working collaboratively, problem solving, resilience. And the second aspect for me of how teaching uh, coding skills can tackle inequality is the talent pipeline that you're creating. So if we teach coding skills to underrepresented groups, then we're getting more underrepresented groups into tech and diversifying a traditionally very white, very male industry. And diversifying the industry in turn should hopefully lead to more equitable practices, more equitable algorithms, more equitable products, and so on. But don't don't take my word for it, James. We've got some wonderful guests here to um, help us with that question a bit more. Yeah, and and just to sort of chip in, I think you, you I mean, you've given a, a really comprehensive answer there. Um, I think for me as well as a as a teacher, or as a former t- classroom teacher, one of the things was just wanting to share this. What I think is an amazing discipline, an amazing kind of engaging and challenging kind of area with everybody. I want. I thought everybody should should be able to code and program and create and make. And you're right, Gemma. Thankfully, our listeners don't have to rely on just our perspective. I'm really pleased to welcome Nina Sizemore, who has extensive background in translation and supports organisations in reaching global audiences. As an active member of Cambridge Refugee Resettlement Campaign, she organised and ran a co-club for refugee children in Cambridge. Well, Nina, welcome to the podcast. And shall we start with your uh, co-club experience? Can you tell us a bit about how that came about? Yes, of course. Hi, thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Yes, so like you mentioned, I um, was an active member of the Cambridge Refugee Resettlement Campaign. Uh, I volunteered a lot in the um, in their uh, marketing team, trying to get a newsletter out to volunteers. Um, and um, then I moved on to organizing the volunteer force for the for the um, charity. Um, I became a trustee, so I was really very heavily involved. And also as an employee of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, um, you know, being a witness to the amazing mission of the organization, I. Um, you know, I decided to put the two together. It just made such logical sense to um, to um, start a code club for the children um, that the uh, the CRRC was looking after. 
Um, so yeah, I you know I um, asked if I can run the the code club in the office, and I've um, asked uh, my colleagues who whether anyone wanted to help me run the club, um, and yeah, but just just started this way, and then and and we ran it for a year, a really incredible year, um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm very have have very fond memories of it. <laughs> Nina, it's actually quite interesting because, sorry to bust in James, I um, I just started volunteering with the Cambridge um, Refugee Resettlement Campaign. Oh, uh, I had my induction at the weekend and as soon as I said Amazing. I worked at the Raspberry Pi, Pi Foundation, um, they immediately mentioned the coding club. So I think it has left a, um, a wonderful a lasting yeah, impact. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely gutted that we were unable to continue with it. Yeah. But, you know, the pandemic <laughs> yeah, and yeah. kind of ruined all the plans. And now I've moved away from Cambridge. But, um, yeah, I, hopefully maybe you can pick it up. <laughs> yeah, I think I've just dropped myself in that, haven't I? <laughs> yes, yeah, so you kind of have. <laughs> and your uh, your legacy sort of lives on as well. I, I, I can't kind of let the opportunity pass without mentioning that, you know, if you want to see... The, Nina in action all you have to do is go and download issue 11 of hello mm. world who where uh-huh. Nina and one of our co-club uh, participants is 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 a cover star of that oh. issue and forever will be the, <laughs> the face of inclusion for hello world uh, also joining us today is Bharat uh, Vignaraja Bharat has been a software developer for 18 years in both finance and media mostly working on server-side development projects And these are skills which he's applied over the last year as a volunteer with Code Your Future, an organisation who we featured in issue 17 of Hello World. So, Bharat, welcome. Um, Could you briefly explain what the programme is, who it's for, how it works? Yeah, and thanks for having me. Um, And hearing what Nina has to say is like really, really cool. And I think there is definitely some overlap between uh, what I'm doing as well. Um, So, like you mentioned, I've been volunteering with um, Code Your Future for the last year. Um, So this is a a charity, um, mostly volunteer-run organization. uh, And what we aim to do is kind of work with uh, disadvantaged people who are, um, this kind of includes like refugees, asylum seekers, um, people on low income or people with no income, um, and people who are just generally facing a variety of challenges in life um, and from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, and like you mentioned, like mostly backgrounds which are actually underrepresented in the tech industry. Um, but at the same time, these are like very clever people, hardworking, highly motivated and interested in coding. Um, so what, what we try to do is try to work with them, train them up to be full stack developers uh, and then try to get them into the tech industry, working with various companies. Yeah, I think that's what's interesting about it is you're actually helping people to become software developers. Um, yeah, you know, absolutely. It, it's more than just a, um, you know, a, a club for a sort of enjoyment purposes. You're actually training people up with. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And we and we have people of all of all ages. So it, I think in our in our current group of uh, trainees, we our age the ages kind of range from like maybe around 23 to around 60. Um, so these are people who are just um, sort of looking to change careers or change the path in their life uh and, and move into that direction right now so i had a question um there breath about like the sort of the importance of technical skills for this role because you're obviously coming to, with a technical background and i can sort of uh, appreciate that with how easily full stack developer just rolls off the tongue as you say it and some <laughs> of our listeners might not quite know what that means sure. um so i guess my question is could you explain a little bit more about about those those skills and also how important is it that you as a volunteer have those skills to offer or are there other ways that volunteers can contribute yeah so i guess i'll start by saying that there's um definitely many different ways that a volunteer can contribute um and this this kind of includes sort of like the range of like uh, like how many hours you might have to give in your time. Um, if you're very busy, you can just like volunteer for a couple of hours a month, let's say. Um, the, the different types of roles we have include sort of technical roles, but also non-technical roles. We help with sort of, let's say, English language skills, um, interview skills, interpersonal skills, team working skills, all that kind of stuff as well. Um, time management skills so you don't necessarily need to have a technical background to kind of help out uh, mentor people uh, and get involved yeah I think that's uh, quite useful for someone like me to hear who has a I, I 
you know, I always feel like I have to caveat conversations like this saying I'm not I'm not a computing expert. Um, my background was actually in uh, politics and international relations. So I'm interested in this from another um, angle as, as well as the computing angle. So it's I think it's always a relief to hear that you can you can bring something to the table with something like this, um, even if you don't have even if you're not as comfortable with uh, the term full full stack developer as you've uh, <laughs> just alluded to. And thinking about um, your your sort of maybe your volunteering with the Cambridge Refugee Group, is this is that what what sort of skills might Gemma need, Nina, if she wanted to re-establish um, a co club like this? Or if we're talking to our listeners around the world, if they wanted to replicate this, what are the skills that they're going to need to offer this in their areas? Well, the good thing about uh, the co club model is that you really don't need a lot of technical uh, skills or a technical background. I mean, my background is in, is in languages and translation. And, uh, you know, I uh, can barely put two and two together. You know, my math skills are this bad. <laughs> so, um, you know, I am definitely not a, a person that you could imagine running a cold club. Um, and it was definitely something that was very, very much out of my comfort zone. Uh, it took a lot um from me to um gain the confidence to run to, to start running the code club but once we started I, I i saw that it's actually uh you know it just sounds a lot scarier than it is um we use the resources developed by the raspberry pi foundation um you know which are step-by-step -step guides um which you just read ahead of time make sure that you understand everything so that you can support um the children um, and then you just take them through it. So, um, you know, so there actually isn't a, um, um, isn't a requirement to, to have. I'm sure it helps <laughs> for sure. Um, but yeah, if we, you know, we started off with some beginner resources and I felt like we didn't need that technical knowledge in the room. And were there any skills that came with a sort of targeting a co-club at this particular group? You know, are there skills that you need to work with individuals from a, a migrant or a refugee kind of background that you might help you cater? And that, that question really is for, for either Nina or Breath. Um, from my perspective, we definitely struggled a little bit with the English language skills. Um, we worked with children who were at very different um, stages in their uh, journey. Um, some of them had already been in the UK for a while and they spoke um, very good English, whereas some of them were quite new, only recently resettled at that point and um, had very little understanding of English. So, you know, we, that's where we struggled a little bit. Um, and we had to have different approaches to do it to, to the different young people that we, we had in the club. Um, but that just meant that we needed more volunteers. You know, we tried um, using translated resources in Arabic, but because we ourselves didn't speak any Arabic, we felt it wasn't really much point, uh, you know, apart from them being able to read um, um read read the project in Arabic but we wouldn't be able to provide them any support either so you know it, it, we kind of decided against it and we also thought it well it might be good um, to to help these young people develop their English language skills um, and what we found is that the young people were helping each other which was really lovely you know some of the kids that were um, longer in the UK and already spoke English they were helping the the, the, the children who only had recently been resettled so um, so yeah um, so English yeah English was definitely a challenging um, uh, thing and a, and a skill that we needed to work on but also basic computer skills you know we take it for granted um, but some of these children weren't even able to use a mouse so that's something that we had to work um, with them on uh, something that I can do <laughs> so you know <laughs> So that's a tech skill that I, I wasn't lacking. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely agree. I can I can kind of understand like um, what you're saying there. I think we, we face very similar challenges with Code Your Future. Um, obviously, like our, our trainees do come from a, a range of different countries and have uh, different levels of English comprehension. Uh, and of course, like as most of us know, if you're, if you're trying to kind of understand requirements before you're coding something, like um, understanding them is uh, is a big part of the job. Um, we do try to kind of like help them along with their um, English language skills and try to, um, I guess on, on one hand, it's kind of understanding English. On the other hand, it's kind of trying to understand technical information in English, which is like another level <laughs> of understanding that you have to kind of get to. Um, so it's definitely a big challenge. Um, and I can, I can definitely relate as well to what you say with um, not necessarily having basic computer skills as well. Um, I think we have a, a range of um, trainees who some of whom have not really used computers that much um, and 
a few of whom ha ha don't actually even have access to a laptop. So we do try to kind of provide um, that kind of a, a laptop to them uh, in, the, in those situations. But obviously it's kind of trying to get them to, to understand how to use them from scratch. Yeah, I was just about to ask that with um, if, if people don't have the tech um, at home with them between, um, you know, sessions with you, that must be quite difficult. But if you're providing them with a the laptop, I guess that can kind of help. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we, we, we try to provide them with a laptop if we can. Um, I, I think the general philosophy, which I which I've heard from um, Herman Benchy, who's the founder of Code Your Future, he was mentioning before, is to basically try and reuse resources which are not currently being used. So if you have a laptop at home, which is not currently being used, um, it, it can be used by someone. There's definitely someone out there that will need it. Um, or um, we, we also try to have our classes like sort of in person in venues, um, usually in offices, which are kind of not being used on the weekend. Um, for example, um, another example is like our, our volunteers have um, obviously software development skills um, and, and other skills, um, but we try to reuse time that they're not currently using. So it's this kind of like theme of kind of reusing resources which are not currently being used uh, as much as we can. I was going to pick up on, on the thing that both you, you and Nina have, have sort of said, which was around, there's something around the challenges that our learners, whether they're young or old, are kind of facing. And that's the kind of, they've got the, the, the English barrier they've got the sort of technical barrier they've also got the use of a computer and i think not to get too theoretical and pedagogical on you um it feels like we're sort of there talking about um you know we're expecting quite a lot of them and, and we're putting quite a strain on their cognitive loads so they're trying not only to do to read the english and use the computer but then also learn something while they're doing that and so i think the resources that we provide, the scaffolding that helps them overcome some of those challenges is really important. That scaffolding takes the form of the written resources, but also the, the people, the facilitators in the room who can help them feel comfortable and safe and secure and sort of help navigate, which is again, Nina, back to your point about not using the translations, actually having somebody that you could, you know, you could go to if they can't speak your language or you can't communicate, then actually that's a big source of support that's being taken away from you. I, you talked a lot about developers in your in your point there, Brath, and I guess all three of you actually are are volunteering your time, so in different ways. Um, I'm really interested in particularly our guests, but also Gemma, if you want to come in on this, it'd be interesting. What do you get from volunteering? Why do you volunteer? What's in it for you? Without being too mercenary about it, but you must get something from it, right? So I, I get quite a lot out of it. I mean, sometimes I kind of joke around that, like I get more out of it than I'm putting into it. Um, just because, um, like, for example, just the just the inspiration of like w watching um, these people who have um, struggled quite a lot in their lives and had quite a lot of challenges, um, still kind of like forging ahead with this new path. Um, that's that's quite inspirational. Um, and then basically, like every Saturday, we have this lesson, and I usually come out of this lesson feeling really refreshed and rejuvenated just from from working with them. Um, and then and then there's like a few other things. Like I, I think community is a big aspect of what Code Your Future does, and kind of I think maybe what sets it apart from some other um, similar organizations. Um, there's definitely a very very much like a community feel between the trainees and the volunteers uh, and and the other people around CYF. Um, and you, you, you kind of just really get to know people on a personal level. Um, and that's just really rewarding to, uh, to work with. Yes, I was going to say, actually, I remember um, from editing the article about um, Code Your Future in issue 17 that a lot of volunteers were saying that they gained a huge amount of confidence from, um, from the program, from volunteering themselves. So a lot of people said that they gained leadership skills, presentation skills, mentoring skills, uh, as well as that kind of warm and fuzzy um, glow <laughs> that you get from helping out. So I suppose it's, it, it seems like a quite good way to build your, your own soft skills as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and th there's a lot of volunteers that we have that come forward who start as sort of teaching assistants, uh, maybe not speaking in front of like a larger group, but maybe working with people one-to-one, -one, but then they might move into kind of like teaching a lesson here and there uh, in front of a, a larger group of people. Um, and then, you know, you kind of have to work on your presentation skills, your time management skills. There's a lot that goes into it that maybe is not necessarily obvious on the, on the surface of it. 
Um, yes, I mean, I, I probably have similar um, experiences um, in terms of what I get f- um, from volunteering. I, um, you know, when in my time, uh, during my time uh, with Cambridge Refugee Risk Settlement Campaign, I tried lots of different things, you know, and, and one of the things that I, I enjoyed a lot was working with volunteers. Um, and it just gave me a different perspective. I work with volunteers at the Raspberry Pi Foundation as well. And um, being able to get a different perspective and different type of experience uh, was really helpful for my job in general. So, you know, again, that kind of skills that I gained and confidence in what I do for sure. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, in terms of that fuzzy feeling, I, um, you know, just, just having those kids in the room, goofing around and playing and, you know, the smiles on their faces and the happiness when they received their little scratch certificates. It was just, you know, it's just pure joy. And it was just such an amazing feeling. And, um, and just, you know, they, they thought that I'm, um, um, facilitating their learning and, and then hopefully maybe in the future, you know, joining one of, uh, one of the Code Your Futures courses perhaps or you know we're um, going to university to study computing you know it's it's yeah it's just a great feeling and and just my way of giving back a little bit um yeah and Nina you mentioned there and I can't let you off the I can't let you you know can't do a podcast without asking you a little bit about um your volunteer community that you've built over the last couple of years so I know that you've built this amazing community around the world to help translate, um, and and that's all volunteer driven. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that briefly and um, how people can get involved? Sure. Um, yes. So um, you know, Raspberry Pi Foundation develops uh, amazing resources for kids to learn about coding, physical computing, and so on. And uh, you know, there's a, a, an incredible body of research showing that learning in uh, one's native language um, results in, in better social and learning outcomes. And it just makes sense for us to translate those resources. Uh, you know, it's good for for, uh, for um, uh, helping girls um, access um, education and to do better. It's better better for. Uh, test scores it's um you know even there is a there is a um a specific study into learning programming in a native language which shows that you know if you learn um in your mother tongue um, as opposed to english even if you know english very well you still do better when you learn in your native language so you know it, it makes a lot of sense to to translate resources and so yeah the raspberry pi foundation we've decided to um to um uh, make the most of the amazing um, support that we get from people around the world. And um, we've built a community of volunteer translators who, who translate those resources for us. You know, we have an infrastructure for people to, to do it in the most effective and easy way. Uh, you know, lots of our re- uh, uh, volunteers aren't uh, professional translators, so they don't know much about what transition is about and about um, all of the technology out there for translation. So we've made it as simple as possible. We provide them with all the help they need um, training, tutorials, um, you know, very, um, very introductory information about translation so that they can make informed decision in their work. Um, yeah, and we've translated, we've, we've created, um, I think, around 1700 translations now. Um, uh, so, um, you know, lots and lots of different scratch, mainly scratch and Python projects on our website are available in, um, in lots of different languages. Um, and if anyone would like to join, they can just go to rpf.io slash translate and have a look there. Everything is laid out and um, they can have a look and see if that's something for them. When we're talking about translation, are, are we just talking about language or are we also talking about kind of bringing in uh, different cultural contexts? Um, so um, at the foundation, I work as part of the informal learning team, which is the team that um, produces the, the um, non-formal educational content. And we, when we develop resources, we try to make them as culturally relevant as possible. It's not always possible, you know, uh, but we do our best to think of our global audiences when we uh, develop content. Um, when we translate it, we... Um, uh, you know, we don't do much in terms of adapting the content, um, but we do um, um, 
make all of the screenshots available. Like we re- we do all of the screenshots to make sure everything is in the in the local language rather than in English. So when you go on to uh, a, a translated resource, it's fully available in the language of the um, of the speaker, so that they can just go through the con- the project as if it was written for them. I think I'm right in saying that the um, a lot of the kind of idiom and that that kind of stuff is 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 almost removed before it kind of gets to the translation stage to make it more accessible and less challenging for the translators to have to kind of translate references to things that don't make sense in the culture necessarily. That's right. Yes, yes. So we we started with uh, developing some training for content writers at the foundation to make them aware of some of the pitfalls that translators face in the in translation, so that we could not have them in the text in the first place. Um, and uh, But yeah, we've now kind of also um, started thinking about how to write our content in a more international way so that it's not very kind of, you know, it, it's not necessarily just very Western in, um, in um, um, it doesn't have this very Western perspective that we think of, you know, what is going to be relevant for, for, our, um, for our learners around the world. So the, the dreaded cup of tea, make a cup of tea kind of, you know, algorithm mm. is, is banished. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's good. That's good. <laughs> okay, so um, I think what would be really interesting to hear is from, from both of you, from both Nina and Brett, is what, um, what the people who have taken part in these programs, the young people for Nina and those um, people taking part in the Code Your Future program, what have those people got out of um, those programs? There hasn't been much of a follow-up um, as a result of um, my code club. So it's difficult for me to say for sure. But, you know, just judging from what I saw when we were running the sessions, you know, I could see the young people grow in confidence and especially the girls, um, you know, seeing that this is something that they can also do, computers, you know, where... Uh, and they can be successful in it and they can really master it. Um, there's this one particular memory that I have when two new girls joined um, our club and we were going through a scratch project um, and they had very limited understanding of English and they had very limited not, um, uh, experience using computers. And there's this one girl in particular that um, had already been uh, attending sessions for a while and um, she felt so confident and she felt so proud of herself when she was able to help the other two girls and show them how scratch works and where to click and where to go and just the you know the kind of sense of pride that she she showed it was just you know a really really amazing moment because you could see she was empowered that she could see this is something that is actually for her it's not just it's not just something for you know, others for boys, um, that, she, that, that uh, you know, that is something that she could do as well. And that was a really powerful f- moment for me. And I hope it was for her as well. Um, yeah, that's yes, and, belonging. Mm, yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Like she, you know, she, it was just normal for her. Oh, you know. I guess maybe the answer for me is a little bit different from the Code Your Future perspective, just because we are dealing with um, adults. Um, and what we try to do is we try to work with them um, to the point where they're actually doing sort of interviews with companies and hopefully getting a job at the end of the, at the end of the process. Um, so I think in terms of the impact that it has on those learners, I think ideally it would be a job in the tech industry at the end of it. Um, one of the things that we love to see actually is when we have um, some of our former trainees come back and volunteer again and speak with um, sort of the new trainees that are coming through um, our program. Um, I guess, I guess the impact that we have as people in the software industry talking to the trainees is one thing, but like to see them and how they react to uh, former students who have been in their shoes just a year or two years before is, uh, is just like a whole, a whole other. Um... Yeah, <laughs> it must be incredibly motivating to see somebody um, Definitely, yeah. think, oh, that, well, that could be me. This isn't just a sort of pipe dream. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you're a learner, you you always have probably this a little bit of doubt in your mind, like, is this actually going to lead to something? Am I actually going to get a job out of this to to be able to see that uh, is um, definitely valuable? Yeah. And especially when you're a complete if you're coming in this as a complete beginner, um, you know, I, I, when you're when you're starting from from scratch, I think it might be quite scary to think in in a year, a year and a half, whatever the timeline may be. Um, you know, you might not necessarily believe that that's going to happen. So yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it gives them some perspective. It gives them some hope. Yeah, and to see, yeah, exactly, to see somebody, somebody exactly like them, and um, 
know that this is the right place for them um, and that they're welcome there. Super. Well, um, thank you, Nina and Breath. And maybe the, the final kind of question is, um, if, our, if our listeners want to uh, find out more about your work or connect with you individually, where can they find you online? Nina, how about you? Probably the best place to go is LinkedIn. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure there isn't many national Morris out there. So um, <laughs> so <laughs> just look me up and uh, send me a message. I'll be happy to connect. Great. Well, we'll include you in the show notes, if that's all right, Nina. Absolutely. And Breath, where can people get in contact with you? Yeah, I think um, probably the best place to go would be to just go to the codeyearfuture.io website. Um, there's a contact page there. Um, there's more information about like volunteering, the different types of ways that you can volunteer and help out. Um, yeah, that would probably be the best place. I found that conversation really fascinating and super valuable. Um, we asked you, our audience, whether you thought that learning computing and programming skills could help tackle inequality that is faced by learners, whether they are young or old. And a um, friend of the podcast, Yolanda, came back and said that she wholeheartedly believed that computing and programming skills will help to level the playing field for students. And Nicholas Provenzano had an important caveat to add. He believes that coding can positively impact inequality issues, but that if people don't have access to devices and the internet in the first place, they will always be at a disadvantage. And finally, Alexis Kobo, uh, who joined us on, the, on our last episode of the podcast, um, talked again about equity and access and inclusion all being pathways to help widen participation in computing. And yes, there are barriers, uh, but uh, things like teacher PD and investments uh, into CS will help us tackle those inequalities over time. If you have a question for us or a comment about our discussion today, then you can email via podcast at helloworld.cc or you can tweet us at at helloworld underscore edu. My thanks to Nina and Barath for sharing their time, experience and expertise with us today. Next time, we'll be talking about methodologies that we can take from industry and apply within our computing classroom. So, Gemma, what did we learn today? What have I learnt? Well, I've learnt that I've probably volunteered myself to restart Nina's Code Club. So perhaps the lesson for me there is to keep quiet. Um, in all seriousness, this has been a really interesting conversation, especially hearing about both ends of the spectrum, um, the community support for young people through Nina's work, right up to learning skills to enter the tech industry as an adult with Barath. Great. And I took away really that um, I can stop pretending to be technically knowledgeable as this is a skill that I don't need in order to volunteer. Mm -hmm.